Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well and for this week's interview we've got an interesting one. I wasn't really initially interested in taking on interviews from Navy, Na the Navy, Navy guys yet, even though I would absolutely love to. In some ways I prefer naval warfare even to aerial warfare, but you know there's only so much we can do. But for this one it just sounded too cool and so I wanted to do it. We've got a chap by the name of Stukid, nuclear machinists mate on the USS Nimitz CVN 68. The synopsis. Joined the Navy in December 2017. Graduated boot camp in February 2018. Graduated uh, graduated A school in May 2018. Graduated nuclear power school, as you do, in January 2019. Graduated nuclear power prototype prototype training in two, July 2019, reported to the USS Nimitz CVN-68 in August 2019, where I currently serve. Prior Navy, I built drones, as you do, and did freelance IT work for whoever was paying, joined for stability and travel. Uh, things, I can see why, if I could go back and join the Navy, I would be so tempted. Uh, things I can talk about, basics of nuclear power and how we keep the ship running, civilian application of nuclear power and safety, life on an aircraft carrier for enlisted personnel both in port and at sea, what the process of enlisting in the Navy is like uh, up until reporting to your first ship, things we can't talk about, specifics of how Navy nuclear plants work and specifically how certain parts of our steam plants work which is why i really want to know but never mind personally uh, identifying information political topics since i'm the speaker as a sailor and not a private citizen this is best avoided now as usual uh, my job should have been off should have been to go off and uh, research read a book about nuclear um, nimitz class and whatnot but i haven't just haven't had the time so we're going to just Chuck our way through it and see what happens. Say hello, uh, Mr. Snooky, and anything you want to say to the viewers before we start. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, obviously going by my screen name to keep my uh, private details uh, as they are private. But yeah, uh, I mean, I wouldn't worry about the research, Cap. That's kind of why I'm... Roger. Okay, well, let's blast away. We've got lots of questions and not much time, so we'll just see how it goes. One, was joining the Navy your goal since a young age... Or if not, how did you grow into the idea of being a sailor? You've got, or kind of already answered this, but um, uh, your answer, please. Uh, so when I was a bit younger, high school age, I was uh, interested in being a Navy pilot, actually, and uh, visited the Navy Academy, which is the most straightforward way to get into doing most of the officer jobs, especially the ones with limited uh, capacity, like pilots. And uh, I hated the way that they were at school. Uh, you were very restricted. It was, it was very military from the very beginning, and it was very, very restricted uh, for how you do your first entire year of school, and I didn't like it, so I decided to go to a different college, and uh, that didn't go well because I partied too much, so mm. standard uh, nuke story there. If you talk to most of the nukes in the Navy, they will say something about, oh yeah, I went to college and didn't do well because I was too busy you know, messing around instead of doing my classes, so... <laughs> I'm one of those, and uh, now I do nuclear power. Roger, can I ask how old you are, just to give me an idea? Sure, I'm uh, I'm 25. 25, Roger, yep, yeah, I guess that. Okay, very good. Uh, how big are the reactors? Interesting question, if you can answer it, I don't know if you can. How big, roughly, are the reactors on the carrier? Can you give us something to compare the sizes? Uh, sure, so first, uh, I'll be able to answer a lot more than you'd expect. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, a, not that much stuff is actually classified, okay. it's usually the specifics. So I'll be able to give you guys a really good uh, idea of what's going on, mm -hmm. but as far as the reactor size go, uh, think of a school bus mm -hmm. uh, standing on its back. That's about the size of each of the reactors. That's what? just the reactor, to be clear, not the rest of the plant. There's that, a lot more stuff. That is actually quite big then, isn't it? Because obviously that's not as big as ones that we're familiar with, like uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Obviously, we've all seen pictures and, and, and diagrams of that. But it is still fairly big, bearing in mind it's just a ship. Um, we now, is there, do we know how much electricity this thing produces or how much power this thing produces, like globally? Uh, so each of the reactors is around 150 megawatts for output. Um, that's a public number. Uh, realistically, we can surpass that if we need to, but there's never really a need on the carrier. We, we tend to have more than we need. And how many reactors do you have? Uh, two. Right. Okay, so it's three. Was, th was that 300 megawatts? 
Yes, and uh, that's quite a lot. Um, I mean, it doesn't sound like much, but remember that we're a closed system. We're just a ship. We're not a uh, like a whole city. Okay. So 300 is quite a lot. We almost never go near the limits of what we... Roger. Artie, in the background, can you go and see what the average power station kicks out so we can get an idea of course, 300 megawatts doesn't mean anything to me. Okay, very interesting. Good start. Um, okay, would you ever consider a transfer to a, oh, interesting, a nuclear submarine? Can you comment on the similarities between the reactor on a carrier versus a sub? Uh, so I would never consider a transfer to a submarine. I do not like the idea of being underwater in a tin mm -hmm. can uh, and being uh, stuck there. There's not really any escape method on a submarine. At least I can jump off the side if something happens to the carrier. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, as far as similarities go, it pretty much stops at they are both pressurized water reactors. That's Other than that, I mean, the, the basics are the same, but outside of that, it's very different. Roger. Interesting. Yeah, I'm the same. I'd love to, love to serve on a ship, but a submarine, yeah, definitely not. Everything about that is terrifying, basically. But very good. Um, are technical and military staff very separate, separated, or do you mingle a lot with the pilots slash officers in your free time? Uh, so I've uh, I've definitely talked to some pilots. There's a spot up on the uh, island, which is the superstructure that sticks up above the flight deck. Uh, we call it Vultures Row, which are you, somewhere you can go whenever you want to uh, watch flight ops if you're interested in doing so. Uh, but I've, I've ran into officers and pilots up there, and I've, I've talked to them a couple times. Uh, generally speaking, I'll end up talking to my officers in my department more often than anything else. But, I mean, with my officers, we're very close. Uh, we hang out. We do stuff together. We play board games in one of our spaces sometimes. I mean, it, we're, we're very... Uh, I don't know, I guess familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, there's obviously the professionalism level where I have to be respectful, but, you know, we, we do a good time together. Uh, as far as other departments, we don't mingle too much, mostly because the nukes have their... I don't know, we have this kind of personality where we don't like to walk around the rest of the ship very often. It's it's not uncommon, but most of the time, people you're going to find the nukes are hanging out in their spots, not at other places where we do, we'd find other people. And all of our spaces are restricted to just us. So you end up not seeing many people other, there, other than the department. Roger. And just to go back a little bit, just from the guys, roughly speaking, one megawatt is going to power 100 homes. So 300 megawatts is going to be 30,000. So your ship could essentially power on a daily average of 30,000 homes, which is really quite amazing when you think about it, isn't it? Considering that's one ship, which is the size of, I don't know, maybe 100 houses, yet it could power 30,000 houses. That's quite an interesting ratio, I think. Uh, as well as that, Chernobyl had four times 1,000 megawatt reactors. So four times, what's 4,000? So 4,000 megawatts. Uh, 4,000 divided by 300 is, it was 13 times more than the ship. It really shows how powerful that ship is, though. I wouldn't have had the foggiest that it would be that amount of power. Do we know of that amount of power, how much goes into kinetically driving the ship with the prop? And how much goes into surplus, or do you not have those figures available? So about half of what we produce is going to go into driving the ship if we're going fast. Mm -hmm. um, if we're not going very fast, we don't use very much of the power at all to drive the ship. But it's really a ratio. There's a question further down that uh, we can just answer it now since it applies. There's something further down that says something about what controls the amount of power that the generate react uh, number 17 there there you go uh, so this is the what is the power output of the reactors and to what percent do we go on a daily basis mm -hmm. if it's more when we're busy um, so there's steam demand and, and the power the reactor is generating basically the way that it ends up working because there's a, a, a feedback loop with temperature the where the temperature of the water going through the reactor controls power to a degree uh, it ends up doing almost all the work for us. So if we draw more steam, the water gets colder, which makes the power go up, which heats the water back up to where it needs to be to, to make more steam. So as it, it really just kind of takes care of itself in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, if we're you know barely moving, going like five knots, we're not going to pull very much steam. So the reactor will not be producing very much power. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's it's interesting how that relationship works, and it's become a bit of a meme in our community as well where uh, there's a, a Facebook group that exists and there's, a, you know, hilarious pictures of, like, there'll be a picture of some guy following a girl through a parking garage and the the guy will be labeled uh, reactor power and the girl will be labeled steam demand. <laughs> uh, just silly things like that happen. Um, but, yes, it's it's all based on steam demand. So if we, if we ask for more steam, 
it'll happen, and then the reactor will make its way up to meet that demand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, good. Um, oh, I'm just keep thinking of questions. Uh, 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 right, sorry. Uh, what do you do in your spare time on the aircraft carrier? I'm guessing there's a lot of stuff to do there because it's like a 1,000, 5,000-person ship or 3,000, I forget now. It's uh, it's about five and a half with the air wing on board. It's uh, only about three with just the ship's company. So mm -hmm. we actually don't have our ship's company in the same port as us. Mm -hmm. uh, the ship's company, I'm sorry, we don't have the air wing in the same port as us. Ship's company is obviously with the ship. Uh, we're in Bremerton, Washington, though. And uh, the air wing is down in San Diego. So we go down to pick up the air wing every time we leave to go do something important. Uh, as far as that goes, though... Uh, I mean, so we do, we try to do some stuff for our department. Like we have ice cream socials periodically where we go get ice cream from the mess deck people and, uh, you know, take it up to one of the rooms and we hang out and do, do some ice cream eating and some, some card games. Usually, uh, the most common thing I find myself doing is playing card games with my friends or playing video games in my birthing. So, I mean, the Nintendo switch has been <laughs> quite iconic for aircraft carriers or just people in the Navy in general, I assume, since it's an actual console you can just hold in your hands. So that's been really nice. Uh, being able to play games like Zelda or Witcher 3 have been amazing while you're uh, in the middle of the ocean. Oh, no. But we also do a board game thing every week. So every week we have a, we have one of the largest uh, spaces on the ship as far as uh, like capacity of people, tables, etc. Et and we'll go down there and play board games as a big group. Roger. Sounds, to be honest, pretty awesome. Um, okay, very good. Uh, how much personal space? Space is obviously always a problem on vessels. How much personal space do you have? So we have less of a space problem than other ships as far as the, the ship as a whole, but uh, as far as an enlisted sailor, especially a junior enlisted sailor, someone who's not at least an E7 or above, mm -hmm. uh, you have your rack opens up, so your rack being your bed, you can unlock it, it'll hinge open, and there's a, a hydraulic system and a stand in there to keep it from falling on your head because it's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. And inside that, you've got roughly 25 cubic feet of space, and then there's a locker somewhere nearby that's got another uh, 27 cubic feet of space. So you have roughly 50 cubic feet of space, if that uh, helps. Uh, to make it a little bit easier to think about, the locker itself is uh, about 8 inches wide, about 2 feet deep, and about 4 feet tall. Roger. Um, I'm reading about Oliver has a Perry frigate, kind of lightweight, fast frigates at the moment, and they have, per room, they have 100... Um, uh, racks. How many per? Do you, how many racks do you have per room, or is it just not relevant the way yours is laid out? Uh, so ours is a bit different. Obviously, it's a bigger ship. So we have. The, it depends on which birthing you're talking about. Mm. Ours, the, the one I live in personally, is the mechanic birthing. So mm. we have we have two divisions of mechanics, roughly two hundred and ten people, and they all stay in the same space. And we have a we have a few extra racks. So mm. there's it's like general population in a prison down. Roger, I guess, because you've got, I think, less than 200 in the entire frigate, so I guess it's a different deal, but okay, very good. Um, right, where are we? How often do, does accidents occur? I mean, I guess it depends what you define by accident, but you can answer the question however you want. What are the most recurrent failures in your experience? How deep are the safety protocols implied? Martin Renders. So we've, uh, the Navy's never had a nuclear accident to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, we, and when I say nuclear accident, that means the release of radioactive mm -hmm. uh, fission products into something outside of the uh, the ship. We've never, to my knowledge, had one where it even got out of the primary system, which would be the actual sealed system where the water that goes through the reactor is. Uh, we're very good about our maintenance and our, our safety protocols. We, we really do take it seriously, as you might expect. Uh, it is nuclear power, so you really don't mm -hmm. want to have any problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's never been anything major that's ever happened on a nuclear vessel, and I, I, I would definitely chalk that up to the attention to detail and the uh, maintenance practices that the Navy follows in the nuclear part of itself. Uh, as far as recurrent failures, we often have pumps that just stop working, uh, usually not super important pumps because the super important pumps are quite reliable. Um and then as far as safety protocols go, we have uh, three redundant backup mm -hmm. systems as far as keeping the reactor from doing anything mm -hmm. unsafe. Uh, there's a lot of automatic trips and things that will cause the reactor to put itself into a safe condition before anything bad has the chance to happen. So generally speaking, if you have a problem, it's not that anything actually went wrong. It's that you were on the way to something going wrong and the system took over and said, no, 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 and 
uh, if we have control rods, as mm -hmm, all reactors yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. It will drop all of those to the bottom and just say, no, we're done. We're shutting down right now because you mm -hmm. guys are doing something unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, and those things can are usually are caused by someone doing something accidentally. So let's say there's a, a, a turbine generating power for some pumps that run water through the reactor. If somebody turns that turbine off by accident, it's the wrong one or something like that. If there's no flow through the reactor, it will immediately drop all the rods. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, there's no reason not to do that. So generally speaking, if anything is going to go wrong, it's taken care of before anything bad could possibly happen. I mean, we're talking hours before something mm -hmm. bad happens. This, the, it completely shuts itself down. If you Would you say, I mean, it's hard to say, but would you say there are more safety procedures and redundancies in your type of... Uh, setup than in a civilian setup, but the reason I say is because you know Fukushima was supposed to be unfallible, and it had a wave, you know, a big wave come in, and it what turned out it wasn't infallible. Um, what was your be your answer to that? So our, I would actually say we have less, um, hmm. but our last line of defense is very final. Um, it will render the reactor useless in the future. So mm -hmm. if it happens and we have to do that, there's the ship is basically retired at that mm -hmm. point. Wow. But uh, I know. Uh, but the the big difference there would be that we are first of all floating on water, so that's good, right? We have a limited source of water. Second of all, uh, that that seawater, not the kind of water we want to put in the reactor, but mm -hmm. if we fill it up with seawater, it's it's going to be okay, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to melt. It's not going to heat up anymore. That seawater will pull all the heat out and keep things safe. Mm -hmm. So our final line of defense is basically just flood it with seawater. Mm -hmm. Um, and as a result, uh, we likely would never have a situation like Fukushima, even if the ship was about to be destroyed, we probably wouldn't get the quite that far. Um, but as far as Fukushima goes, the issue they ran into, uh, we actually, about all of the other nuclear power plants that have had problems in the past. Roger. Okay. Uh, Fukushima goes... Go, Go ahead. Those lines. So on a regular cruise, uh, you know, a six-month cruise, do you ever have any um, turbine trips or, or scrams? Uh, it's it's completely normal to have something happen. We In fact, yeah. we do them all the time for uh, training purposes, mm -hmm. just so we know what to do when they happen when we're not expecting them. But it's it's extremely common. Uh, not in a way that would be unsafe or, like, affect our ability to complete our mission. It's just more of a... We'll be doing something for training. It's usually in the middle of the night, so that doesn't affect anybody else or the mission. Um, but we'll, So if we're doing things that it need, let's say we're launching planes, right? We would not do anything uh, training-wise that could possibly affect that. We would just let everything run and leave it alone and just you know stand our watches, take our logs. But if we're doing training, every once in a while someone makes a mistake, like I said, and they, they turn off the wrong thing or trip the wrong thing, and that causes an issue where you might end up with a scram. However... Uh, as far as like it happening on its own during normal operations when we're not doing anything, that's relatively rare. Okay. Roger. Okay. There's a million follow-ups I want to ask, but I'm going to move on. Um, uh, where are we? Uh, what is included in daily reactor maintenance, and is there a big checkup often? Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but okay. Uh, if so, what's different, different between those and the normal ones? Uh, there's plenty of daily maintenance. It usually involves taking apart some piece of equipment, uh, you know, checking and making sure that it's good to go. Maybe it's checking bearings. Maybe it's checking uh, that the uh, seals are correct. Things like that. Uh, just little stuff. We do that all the time. Um, and we have extra. We have multiple of every piece of equipment we need. So you can just put it on, put the system on one of the ones that you're not going to do maintenance on, and then take shut the other one out. You know, shut some valves where it's isolated, and then take it apart, do what you need to do, put it back together. Um, and then there, as far as a big checkup goes, we do have a large inspection that happens every year. It's called uh, ORS, uh, React Operational Reactor Safety Examination, I think is what it stands for. I could be wrong. I don't know. We just call it ORS. <laughs> um, and that happens every year. Uh, the big difference there would be that during ORS, we have an entire inspection team come on board and talk to us. Uh, we go through some drills, we do some testing, and they, they make sure that we know what we're doing. A lot of what our job is knowledge of how the plant works, how the systems interact, and what to do when bad things happen. So they do a bunch of tests and drills to make sure that we're not stupid and we know what to do when bad things happen. Roger. Very good. Okay, um, talk us through an average day for you. Uh, so we'll, we'll get up when it's time to get up, unless you have watch uh, outside of normal work hours, in which case... That sucks. Your sleep's going to suffer a little bit. So you, you stand your watch when it happens. But let's say we have watch during the regular workday. So you'll wake up 
normal time. It's uh, we're usually doing things. We start around seven o'clock, maybe seven thirty. Uh, we go to work. You'll show up at your quarters, which is where everybody just kind of shows up. We take a muster, make sure everybody's awake and uh, up and at them. And then uh, we'll talk about some things that are happening for the day, talk about anything that's going to change soon, any big events, and then we'll uh, disperse. And you'll go either do maintenance in the plant, which is a lot of maintenance to do all the time, or you'll uh, go stand your watch, which standing your watch is literally just you're stationed in a specific area of the plant. You have a set of logs to take, which is just you know, you're going to write down some numbers from some gauges or maybe write yes or no on some stuff, just looking at different things in the plant, making sure everything's the way it should be. And then uh, after your watch is over and the, the work day ends, you have some time to do whatever you'd like to do. Maybe you go to the gym, maybe you play games with your buds, uh, whatever you want to do, and then you go back to sleep, wake up the next day and start over. Uh, not that much free time in our department. We do have a lot to do. So typically speaking, we don't get more than maybe an hour or two of free time a day when we're out to sea, but you get used to it after a while. Roger. Okay, interesting, well, weird question. What is your favorite port? I uh, haven't been across the the big ocean yet, but as far as uh, the United States goes, I've been to San Diego a few times, and I've been up to a uh, weapons magazine, which is just a place where we store uh, ammunition, bombs, etc. Uh, the port by the weapons magazine was a very small town, and it had a very interesting downtown area to go to. There were some good restaurants and some very good craft beer to go get, which is a big thing for me. So that one was my favorite, although San Diego's a very close second. Obviously, San Diego's got plenty to do. The downtown area is phenomenal. Uh, so I don't have the best answer for that because I haven't been anywhere outside the U.S. as far as my Navy career goes. But uh, we, there's always it's always nice to be somewhere you're not living and have the ability to go and uh, explore a new place. More jump. Okay, very good. Uh, now, we've already answered 16, haven't we? About how we divide the power. Or 11 there? Uh, 16. Well, I've got. Let me highlight it with my blue, with the star by it. We've done that one, haven't we? Yep, I see that one as 11. So, yep, mm. we, uh, I mean, we talked about that. It's direct power follows steam demand. Roger. Don't know why we've got different numbers, but never mind. Uh, yep, that's all good. Uh, how hard is it to operate two nuclear reactors? Or maybe I could re rephrase that better. How are personnel kind of organized? Are you in separate teams, or how does that work? So, the. Having two reactors wouldn't change things much as far as having one reactor goes. The biggest difference is if one of them has to scram out, we can just cross-connect everything and, and keep running off of one of the plants instead of both. Um, it's not necessarily difficult as much as it is time-consuming. We have a, Our department is about 500 people when we're fully manned, and it's, uh, we're on a 24-hour watch rotation with a lot of places to fill and a lot of bodies that need to be downstairs doing things all the time. So it's it's very time consuming and it does it does affect our ability to uh, have free time, which can be bad, but can I don't know. It depends on your work ethic. If you like to be busy and working, then it's not a big deal. If you like your free time, then it can kind of suck. Uh, it does affect our ability to do things. Uh, there's another question downstairs. We'll get to that later. Actually, mm -hmm. I'll just leave that for then. Well, Jeff, very good. And the next one's interesting. On training, do you guys get instructions? Um, uh, you can only talk about so much, but inst instructions or training to if the reactor received battle damage, so battle from uh, damage from a third party. What would happen, considering situations like receiving so much damage that a nuclear meltdown is imminent? Uh, what would happen with the ship, the crew, post precautions and debris? You've kind of talked about the what you're supposed to do. But anything you'd like to add? Uh, the big one would be that depending on where the ship is, let's say we're going down, right, we're sinking. Mm -hmm. Depending on where that is, if we're going to sink in the middle of the ocean nice and deep, it's really not a problem mm -hmm. at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Once the ship sinks, there's enough water and enough pressure on the reactor itself that nothing bad's really going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, if we're very close to the shore, so if we're you know sitting off the coast of California five miles out, that could be a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, we have that last line of defense that is designed to contain all of the stuff that would be bad inside of the reactor compartment. So it is actually in its own little volume inside the ship, and there's a, a big shield around it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. The system is designed to keep everything inside there and to fill that with water. And it mm -hmm. should do that fast enough that by the time the ship goes under and we have no control over the systems anymore, the reactor should be in a safe enough condition mm -hmm. to not have any problems or release anything bad. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there'd be a big recovery effort trying to get the, uh, the nuclear material out of the ship at some point but it would be i'm sure a, a ridiculous debacle yeah. to try and pull that off so mm -hmm. i don't we don't really know how that part goes obviously but mm -hmm. as far as battle damage we should be okay there shouldn't be any major issues again so we've got redundancies in there so it's designed to 
basically sacrifice itself rather than melt down, if you know what I mean, by the sounds of things. That's correct. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, right, how noisy is it below decks on a carrier when the air wing is active and planes are being launched and recovered? Uh, it definitely depends on where you are. If I'm in the office of my uh, division, uh, we are right next to one of the arresting gears, uh, particularly the three-wire arresting gear, which mm -hmm. is obviously the one you want. Mm -hmm. So uh, we often hear, uh, you, we can actually turn on, there's a, a closed-circuit TV system on the ship. We mm -hmm. play movies on some channels, but there's always a, a channel that has the above-deck cameras online for the LSO camera and the uh, deck cameras. So we can actually watch the planes land from the office, and uh, it's, it's interesting to watch the planes coming in on approach through the LSO's view, and then it'll switch to the deck camera as it touches down, and you'll hear the arresting gear mm -hmm. uh, deploy, and you'll hear all that hydraulic and mm -hmm. the pressure uh, stopping the aircraft. So it can be noisy, but if I go down to the plant, you can't hear anything mm -hmm. besides the plant. Mm -hmm. The plant's quite noisy, as you might imagine. How many decks does the carrier have, by the way? I know it's easy to find out, but how many decks, roughly speaking? Uh, it goes up to the 13, I believe, wow. which is really not a deck anymore. Like mm -hmm. So it would be 0-1-3 mm -hmm. is uh, what it is. Uh, that's all the way at the very top of the superstructure. There's mm -hmm. really not anything up there. The highest one you can go inside, I think, is the 11, so the, mm -hmm. z the zero eleven 11 uh, level. And then mm -hmm. that goes down to 1 is is the hangar bay. So mm -hmm. from 1 to zero one 1 up to a zero eleven 11 would be above the hangar bay. Mm -hmm. And then from 1 down to 11 below the hangar bay is the rest of the deck. So I would say roughly 22, 23. Roger. And what's your the lowest you work on in your jurisdiction? All the way to the bottom. <laughs> cool. That's cool. Okay, awesome. It's just you can't get your head around it. If you if you've never been on something like that, you can't get your head around the size of this thing. It's crazy. Um, okay, let's carry on. Um, how big is the crew that takes care of the reactors, and what are their jobs involving? I would imagine it cannot be just a few guys doing it all. Right, we covered that a bit. It's about five hundred people that are mm -hmm. part of the ship's company that take mm -hmm. care of the reactors. Um, we do a lot of the work. We also, when we pull into port uh, shipyard, which would be just a bunch of guys who, it's usually just guys who did my job previously and have gotten out of the Navy and retired and are now just continuing to do that job, but as a civilian, so they don't ride the ship anymore, but they do come in and do maintenance with us or for us when we're in port. Uh, I can't tell you any numbers on their, their bodies, but there's quite a lot of them. They're all over the place when we pull into port. And Roger, this one I think we've answered, but I'll read it out anyway. What is the power output of the reactors and to what percentage of the capacity are they pushed on a busy day for the... So the maximum output total net or gross is going to be 300 megawatts. What's an average, what are they running at on an average day, would you say? Cruise. Uh, really, really shouldn't talk about average mm -hmm. uh, loading for the reactor plant. That's yeah. relatively secret. Uh, not in like a crazy way or national mm -hmm. security way, but that's not, I should, probably shouldn't mention it is my, my point there. Right we did on. skip uh, the question above it, though. Roger, it's almost kind of irrelevant in a way, though, because there's so many different states that the carrier can be in. Is it cruising? Is it cruising at 4 knots, 15 knots? How much, you know, I don't know. That's a complicated one. Um, that I would agree with uh, majorly. That That is a big deciding factor mm -hmm. is uh, since our, our propulsion can draw up to half of the power, it's... It really depends on how fast we're going, whether or not we're launching planes. Uh, the electrical loading tends to stay the same throughout the day. Uh, we usually don't change much as far as how much uh, power is needed to generate el the electricity the carrier needs. Mm -hmm. It really depends on how fast we're going and whether or not we're launching planes. Because it turns out the steam catapults are one of the largest loads on wow. the plant. Wow, I wonder why. In terms of drawing electricity? Uh, no, they they actually just use steam accumulators to mm -hmm. pressurize some steam. They build pressure up oh, to uh, a significant stream. right. Got it. Yep, it oh, is a, a very significant pressure builds up in the accumulators, mm -hmm. and then they just release all that steam into a piston mm -hmm. that which is attached to the shuttle on mm -hmm. the flight deck, and that launches the plane. And they can they have to actually change the amount of uh, pressure being delivered and how fast it's delivered based on the weight of the plane. Yeah. So whether it's a super hornet or a baby hornet, which we do have both. Yeah. We do still use the Charlies. Um, the Marines fly them, not the Navy. So mm -hmm. there's, there's lots of those around. And then uh, same for the arresting gears. When they're coming back to land, their mm -hmm. total fuel, their total aircraft weight, the gross weight of the aircraft actually matters a lot as to how their arresting gear is set. And they do change the loading on the arresting gear based on uh, how interesting what the weight of the aircraft is. Roger. Um, guys in the background, could someone go uh, uh, find out how many joules of energy slash the wattage of a max... Uh, power catapult launch, please. I'd love to know how many, how much power has been developed there or transferred. 
uh, or energy has been transferred. That'd be really interesting. Anyway, let's carry on, guys. Uh, right. If you need to shut, uh, yeah. If you need to shut them both down for whatever reason, is there a plan B power source for the carrier, or would it just go dead? Uh, interesting. Like an auxiliary power unit kind of thing. I think they're asking. Yep, so we have uh, four locomotive diesel engines on board that are hooked up to generators. And if everything goes dark, those will kick on automatically and only power critical systems. Mm -hmm. So what you'll find is, you know, 80 to 90% of the ship is actually dark. There's no electricity running to the lights, so it will go pitch black mm -hmm. inside the ship if you're not in a space that has to have mm -hmm. uh, lighting. One of the nice things is since our department owns everything and our, our equipment is considered essential, our lights do stay on mm -hmm. down in the mm -hmm. plant. But a lot of places, like in mean, the mess deck where you're eating, everything just turns off and goes black. And you have, and a lot of times you have no idea why if you're not mm -hmm. part of the department. Excuse me. Um, to, to grab it before we miss it, uh, we did skip uh, what's on line 21, question 16. It says something about uh, how long it takes before they can be refueled oh, whoops. and the process behind it. Uh, it doesn't take that long, honestly, to cool them down before they can refuel. Uh, it only takes about a month and a half, two months for us to get down to a very safe level of uh, like shut down reactivity, if, uh, which is a very technical word. But uh, it's essentially just how much uh, stuff is going on inside the reactor when all the rods are at the very bottom. It doesn't take too long. It's pretty easy to do. You just let it sit. Uh, as far as refueling goes, they cut big holes in everything, and they start pulling stuff out. There's a whole lot of extra precautions, obviously, because it's a very radioactive substance. So they do all this fancy stuff, but we don't do any of that. Shipyard does all that. So mm -hmm. we just wait, and uh, we get the ship back, and they turn it back over to us whenever they're done. Uh, as far as the fuel, how long it lasts, it's about 25 years. Uh, so about half the life of the carrier. It usually gets refueled once. We have already been refueled. Oh, wow. Uh, the Nimitz is very old. I think the keel was laid back in the 60s or the 50s, so it's a very old ship. Uh, we are going on a deployment relatively soon, and that will probably be our last or our second to last one, depending on how much fuel we burn while we're gone. Interesting. That's give me a load more questions, but I will come back to that. Uh, sorry, did we answer um, if you need to shut down both reactors for whatever reason? Is there a plan B? Yes, sorry, we've got that. Uh, are the other personnel on board a bit scary to scared to come close to your workplace um uh, or and do you ha all have radiation cool stickers on the walls like in the movies interesting uh yes we do have hilarious signs that are over ridiculous on the on the actual doors to our uh, reactor plants uh i think there's i counted one time there's 11 signs on the door that goes to the reactor plant it's also a different kind of door than any other door on the ship uh it's based on uh, the way that door works, if there's pressure inside of the plant, which would happen from a steam leak, if there's steam leaking out of the system, you can't open those doors. They will not open. So they're very different doors. But anyway, there, there are plenty of interesting signs and stickers and, and different things, mostly about uh, you have to have a thermoluminescent dosimeter, which is just a piece of plastic with some stuff inside of it that counts uh, how much radiation you receive. So you can't go down there without one of those. Mojo. Obviously, we want to know how much people radiation are getting, how much radiation people are getting. Uh, it's very low. It turns out we get less radiation than the guys who work on the flight deck do. Ah. But and they hate hearing that. But um, yeah, so it's it's not it's not a big deal as far as radiation absorption goes. But we do have lots of cool stickers and signs all over mm -hmm. the place. They're yellow and uh, purple is the the color scheme. So they're they're everywhere. Mojo. very good, very good. Um, in a theoretical event, event of the ship sinking, we're coming back to this again, what systems are activated so the reactors are secured before being submerged and the hull hits the bottom, like the Kursk? Does anyone know if the Kursk was uh, nuclear, by the way? I can't remember. Are they... it, it was. It was. How interesting. Is the pressure hull intact? Because it wasn't actually damaged, was it? Or was it? Damn, I've forgotten. Uh, so the Kursk had an issue with a uh, primary coolant leak on board, and as a result, they were unable to... Uh, fix it because you can't obviously it's very difficult to walk into an operating reactor compartment mm -hmm. that's the one uh caveat there i've been in the reactor compartment i've walked on top of the reactor but it was shut down mm -hmm. when it's not shut down and it's operating it's very 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 radioactive in that mm -hmm. space and there's the shield on the outside of that space is what keeps us safe it keeps mm -hmm. the um the, the radiation we receive so low uh as far as the curse goes they tried to fix it they lost several crew members as a result there's actually a movies or documentary somewhere about it i think uh, i'm pretty sure we watched it when we were in power school 
Uh, regardless, they had their issue, they couldn't fix it, so they scuttled the ship. Uh, scuttling a ship is the most safe thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Once you scuttle a ship and you create holes where the seawater can get in, that seawater will take all of the heat out of the reactor, prevent it from releasing a bunch of nasty stuff into the atmosphere or the, or the seawater itself. As well as uh, when you release stuff into this, the actual ocean, it's such a large body of water that you're really unlikely to have any major issues as far as uh, what's released. It'll get mm -hmm. so diluted that it's mm -hmm. it's really not any, any yeah, issue at all, like which sounds that, yeah. terrible because yeah. it sounds like we're polluting the ocean. But in reality, it's such a large body of water that mm -hmm. nothing's affected by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'll get that. Captain, I'm step on you for a second. I just want to have follow up on that last question. Uh, Send. So you said that you can't open the door if there's a steam pressure. What if someone's in there? Is there like an escape way to get out of there if you were in there and there was a catastrophic steam leak? Uh, to start, we've never had one. Uh, there's never been an actual steam leak of any kind of severity where anyone was remotely life-threatening. Uh, but if a, an actual steam line rupture happens, whoever's in the plant is going to die. That's just a fact of how that works. Um, if we don't secure those those rooms and keep the steam contained in that space, it will leak and fill the entire ship with steam. So the only option you really have is to have a system in place where when that happens, the people in the space that it happened in immediately are going to essentially be screwed. I mean, they're, they're going to die. Um, but the people outside of that space are not going to die. So you're really minimizing your mm -hmm. casualties at that point. Uh, it's, it's not a fun fact to think about, and we don't like to think about it because it, it would suck, but it's also never happened in the 70-so uh, years we've been doing nuclear power. So it's not a big concern, but it is that final. I mean, if, if that happens, whoever's in the plant is done. Oh, John. Um, and when that happens, like, is there a way for... Because I know the moment that door sealed when during the pressure with the steam superheated steam is released into that space is there a way to safely vent the steam or do you just drop the temperature in that room until it condenses back into a liquid to be at a safe level to enter uh since we're a surface ship we have the ability obviously to exchange air with the outside uh submarines do not have that luxury so the second thing you were talking about is how it works for submarines they secure the leak if they can and then they wait for everything to cool down until they can open the door. Um, as far as we go, though, we can turn all of our ventilation to emergency ventilate, which will suck all of the steam and, and air out of the ship and vent it overboard, which will hopefully happen fast enough to save anybody inside. But the as far as numbers go, you're, you're probably done if you're inside. Yeah, because I've seen what superheated steam can do in documentaries to the human body. Not pretty. I've seen it in real life. It'll surprise you to know that you're more likely to die from the pressure than the temperature. The pressure will increase so quickly that it'll suffocate and crush your body before the temperature has any ability to burn you or, or cause any damage. This is cheery, boys. <laughs> it's quite cool, though. We, we, like the, uh, we like the nasty bit. Uh, just backtracking a bit, about 100 megajoules for a catapult launch and assuming 5 second launch, which is probably actually less than that, but around 20 megawatts. So that's the power of thousands of homes just to do one launch, which is pretty unbelievable. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's push on. I'm sure we'll come back to gory stuff later. Um, I am wondering if you could tell us what portion of radiation your body intakes each year on the ship, and is it mon monitored constantly? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, what's your answer to that? Uh, so we talked about it a hair. Mm. Uh, obviously, it is monitored constantly. We have our little dosimeters on us. Mm -hmm. um, if we go into somewhere with more radiation, we have electronic dosimeters that are more accurate to the uh, minute. Uh, those will actually show you live currently how much radiation you've received since you put it on, mm. which is nice. We use those when we go into the reactor compartment because we want to know how much we're getting. Uh, as far as yearly intake, uh, somewhere between uh, 3 and 10 millirim, which I think if you divide that, or I'm sorry, multiply it by 100, that gives you uh, micro sieverts. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, sieverts is the more common civilian unit. Uh, we use REM for some reason. It's a very archaic unit and... Uh, Probably not the best unit to use, but everything's based on RIM, so we continue to use it. Uh, as far as sieverts go, though, I could just Google it real quick, or somebody else could. It's not a lot. It's extremely little. Uh, you'll never see any effects on your body from the amount of radiation we get. You're more likely to develop cancer if you work on the flight deck than you are if you work in the reactor plant. Uh, what type of reactors are used, and are they different to civilian reactors? Uh, so we use pressurized water reactors, uh, as I've stated. I did link in the uh, public lobby text channel on the Discord yeah. there a uh, nice little GIF of a pressurized water reactor working. Uh, there's plenty of pressurized water reactors in the civilian world. There's also direct boiling reactors, which is what Chernobyl was, and people are surprised to hear that a lot of the time. 
there you go. Somebody linked the conversion there. So we we, we tend to we tend to receive five between five and ten millirem per year, and someone linked that is one sievert is a hundred rem. So it's divided by a hundred. So we would receive even less um, if you use the sievert quantitatively less if you use a sievert measurement. Anyway, as far as the ones powering your homes, uh, the the boiling water reactors that are used in the civilian world are quite different from the Chernobyl reactors. Do rest assured that they are 100% safer than the ones that were used in Chernobyl. Um, but they are that we do still use those, it turns out. Um, as far as the uh, structure of the, the actual reactor core, we use extremely enriched uranium in our reactors so that they are very, very efficient, whereas civilian plants use very raw uranium that's almost not changed from when it's mined. Mm. So their, their concentration of uh, useful fuel is around 8%. Ours is closer to 95 Wow, so that's cheapness, I'm guessing, for people's homes. Uh, they, they don't really need to with how big the reactors mm. are mm. in civilian plants, whereas we're trying to save space, mm. obviously, so we have a very, very, very dense fuel that is very, very, very radioactive. And the only thing that really changes there as far as the operation of the reactor goes is ours don't... Uh, we don't have to pull our rods out very much. They just move very little tiny amounts, and it changes as much as moving you know, 10 times that does mm. for a civilian Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, okay. If the ship is attacked and hit by an anti-ship missile, are the reactors shielded and cannot be reached by the warheads? I bet they're not, but what's your answer to that? Uh, so the Nimitz is the only double hull carrier in the U.S. fleet right now, which means we have two external hulls. Uh, the only reason we're the only one is they built ours, and they were like, nice, double hull. And then they were like, wait a minute, nobody ever attacks carriers, really. And if they mm -hmm. do, this double hull thing isn't really going to matter if they get hit by a torpedo anyway. Mm -hmm. So it does help a bit with uh, anti-ship missiles in theory, obviously never tested. Um, but as far as the reactors taking damage from an anti-ship missile, it's extremely unlikely. They're mostly below the waterline. Anti-ship missiles typically don't hit below the waterline for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. And even if they did, the water will deaden the impact quite significantly. Mm -hmm. as far as the damage to the internals of the ship uh, below the waterline. So they tend to hit right at the waterline as a result, which is mm -hmm. above the reactors. So generally speaking, the reactors are relatively safe from any kind of battle damage. The big thing that would take down a carrier these days would be a torpedo. Uh, we can get into the specifics of how torpedoes cause damage to ships if you want, but that would say be a whole other discussion. Roger. Okay, that's really interesting, actually. Um, I'm glad you said that. I, didn't, I never really thought about that, but okay, well, let's carry on for now. Um, is the cooling system on the reactor a closed circuit or do you have to take water from the ocean as well and do you dump any water back during periods at sea? It is a closed circuit. Um, we do have to add and make up water to it periodically though. Uh, generally because we take samples of the water to make sure that the water is of the quality necessary to maintain the chemistry in the plant and keep uh, corrosion and uh, different mm -hmm. issues down as well as monitor for things like... Uh, lots of radioactive particles in the water, which would indicate to us that we have a problem inside the core. Um, most of the makeup water we add to the plant is because of those samples. Although we do do discharges to the sea periodically, uh, we always uh, first filter and clean that water before we send it out. We try to make it as pure and not radioactive as we can. We do a lot of work to make sure that the water we get rid of is uh, very safe to get rid of. It's usually uh, well below any kind of remotely hazardous material. I mean, I could go stand in that water and nothing bad would happen is, is usually where it's at. Um, but we also monitor how much we release and we, we take a record of how much total uh, radiation for lack of a better, I mean, that's not really what it is, but relatively how much uh, radioactive water we put into the ocean. Mm. Uh, we have a log of that and we, re we submit that report to the uh, Atomic Energy Commission every year, as well as our bosses. Roger. Very good. Um, do you have to power down when, I don't know if it's talked about the reactors, but do you have to power down when at port or do you just plug it into the uh, uh, the mains grid? How does it work when you get to port? Uh, so we don't have to power down, but we usually do. There's no reason to use the reactors when we're in port. We have plenty of support mm -hmm. systems from the uh, the pier. So what we usually do is we'll get, we'll get home and we'll hook up to both steam and electricity from the, the shore, from the pier. And then we'll power everything down and let those systems take over as far as uh, powering things on a ship and keeping anything we need running with steam running. Uh, the reactors uh, do still have the ability to produce steam when they're shut down because we don't usually cool them down that much uh, so that we can, uh, if necessary, very quickly transition back to running off the reactors. Uh, but generally speaking, we don't burn uh, excess fuel while we're just sitting around in port. We will hook up to shore services. More jump. Yeah, makes sense. 
Uh, what were your first impressions when you climb into such a big boat? Is it as cool as it is in the movies? Uh, so my first uh, first time seeing the boat, uh, Washington, first of all, is a, f a very beautiful place to live and, and, and you know, work day to day. Uh, but when we were moving here, we were driving along a coastal highway on the way towards our apartment, uh, my wife and I. And as we came around the corner of one of the, uh, the bends on that highway, we saw the port and uh, the shipyard that my, my ship is stationed in. And we, so there's the Kitty Hawk is here, uh, the USS Kitty Hawk which was uh, one of the two Kitty Hawk class carriers that were built. It was a transition between the Enterprise and the current Nimitz class carriers. Um, it's here. It's a rusted pile of shit, but it's here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I also saw my ship, though, and uh, just driving by it then, uh, it was incredibly huge. And then the first day I came to work uh, and you know reported to my ship, uh, it is as cool as in the movies. You climb aboard, and you're, you're, it's unbelievable how large this uh, the ship is. I even had my parents come up and visit at one point, and I was able to take them aboard and show them around. And uh, I don't think anyone is ready for quite how large the ship is until they actually see it in person and walk on board. It is, it's bigger than you think. Roger, I'd love to see one one day. Uh, are the female personnel on board really fit and nice looking? And if so, is the attraction multiplying a few weeks later at sea? Don't really understand that, but make of it what you will. Uh, we call it uh, we call it bow goggles, actually. Uh, Typically, you don't see uh, a lot of variety of people, right, as you're at sea. Um, so you see the same people every day. And we do find that the uh, single sailors uh, do tend to get flirtier towards the uh, end of uh, underways. Uh, as far as people on board being fit or attractive, um, obviously, you've got your good mix, right? Uh, the Navy is known as the fat branch for a reason. We have some of the lowest standards as far as physical fitness goes. So there are plenty of people who are overweight and unattractive, as you would traditionally call it. But there are also plenty of people who do their do their part, go to the gym all the time, um, stay in very good shape, and as a result, you know, maintain their uh, traditional attractiveness as well. That is very politically correctly answered. I'm very proud of you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> can you have a romantic date on a military ship, or are the chicks off limits? Um, officially, you are restricted from doing anything that would be indicating a uh, romantic relationship between you and another shipmate on the ship. Um, as far as dating goes, you are allowed to date. You just can't do those things on the ship itself. Um, however, there's a you know obviously a chain of command issue there. You can't have an, an E2 enlisted dating in the captain. That's not okay. Um, <laughs> that's a very big uh, mm -hmm. issue with uh, professionalism and, and you know the chain of command mm -hmm. being unbiased. Um, but yeah, I mean, people people go on dates, people hang out, people hook up. It happens. Uh, it's a bunch of horny teenagers, man. You gotta, mm -hmm. you know what you, you know what's gonna happen. Mm hmm. Mm, okay, very good. Uh, tell us an interesting story uh, you will not forget from when on board. So anything, an interesting story that sticks in your mind? Uh, there was a night where we were out um, in uh, the middle of the whatever oceans off the left side of the u.s i couldn't tell you i think it's the pacific um <laughs> anyway we're out doing circles as we do as a carrier uh and uh we went out back to uh relieve some stress at the end of the day uh nice thing about being on the ship you when we're out at sea you can just go wherever you want for the most part mm -hmm. uh the flight deck is off limits during flight operations for obvious safety reasons but there's uh, the fan tail is uh right at the back of the ship um it's on the first deck, so the same level as the hangar bay, but at the back of the ship, there's a platform you can walk out on. And uh, where we happened to be, there was a lot of bioluminescent algae in the water. And this night happened to be a very clear night. Uh, the moon was uh, very, very dim. It was, you know, towards the darker side of its rotation. So we go outside. It's very, very dark. Uh, the water behind the ship where the propellers have been churning the water has activated a bunch of bioluminescent algae so behind the ship there's this long trail of swirling green glowing algae in the water behind the ship which was beautiful and at the same time we look up there's no light pollution out in the middle of the ocean so we look up and the stars are very out it's very easy to see all of these beautiful stars so uh the sights you see when you're out at sea are, are definitely uh amazing and beautiful and that was probably my favorite night on board so far very cool cool okay uh, how good is the food, and are the meals starting to repeat or not taste good uh, later in the mission? Uh, so the Nimitz can uh, cl stake its claim to fame on uh, having, by the Navy's assertion, the uh, best galley in the surface fleet. So apparently we have the best food. It's not very good food. Um, I would much rather not eat on the boat if I have the choice. Mm -hmm. 
but I do eat on the boat every day for lunch during my normal work weeks when we're in port. Um, the food isn't unedible. The food isn't terrible by any means. Uh, this, this rumor that submarines have the best food is only partially true. Uh, they are restricted on what they can carry much more so than us. We resupply every week. They resupply every you know few months. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times we have fresher, better food than they do. Uh, the difference would be that they're cooking small volume. We're cooking for 5,000, 6,000 people. Mm-hmm. So you do get a very school cafeteria style, uh, you know, bulk cooked food. Sometimes it's hot. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it tastes terrible. Sometimes it's great. It's really hit and miss uh, as far as being underway and later in the mission. Like I said, we resupply every week. So unless we haven't had the ability to resupply, generally speaking, the food doesn't really change in quality. Roger. Uh, Can you feel the ship moving or is it completely still, assuming nice weather? Uh, So it it is actually very still when uh, there's nice weather. Uh, Because it's so large, obviously, uh, small changes in the water don't really affect the ship. However, when the the water is rough, I mean somewhere between i think around five to ten foot swells you start to feel Mm. the movement regularly uh when you we've been in up to 50 foot swells with me on Mm. board which is it sounds terrifying Mm. in reality it's not that bad on the carrier it doesn't move Mm. that much um on a smaller ship that would be impassable water like a destroyer you would Mm. not be able to transit through that but we have the ability to since we're so big the best way i can describe it is you're walking down the hallway and sometimes you feel you know, maybe one and a half G's, maybe two G's, and sometimes you feel half a G. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And you can, if once you get your your sea legs, if you will, you can see the uh, the walls. Uh, mostly when you're looking down a longer hallway where you have a decent uh, distance between you and the next uh, bulkhead, mm-hmm. you can see the doorway tilt to the left or the mm-hmm. right as the ship moves. So that's really about it, though. Cool, very cool. Okay, I don't understand this one, but see what you make of it. Are the systems of the reactor always backed up like on the jets? What do you think that means? Um, I think what they're talking about is do we have uh, redundancies and backup systems in general? Uh, and uh, right. of, of course we do. Yeah. Uh, we want lots of redundancy, safety, etc. So, I mean, as, as far as it goes, uh, you could say there's about 50 systems on board, of which about 15 are critical or, or necessary systems that have to be okay. The critical systems have extremely redundant systems in place where they can almost always operate no matter what's going on. As Whereas the rest of them, there's usually just more than one of whatever it is. And the capacities are designed such that you can lose one or two of them and keep operating anyway. So that's that's generally what I would say on that. Roger. The next one's talking about shielding, and I'm interested in this. Could we talk about how everyone, you guys, everyone is shielded from these reactors? So the uh, shielding in place, there's a combination of a few different... Uh, uh, materials used uh, mostly lead and water are the shields we use water turns out to be a very very excellent shield for mm-hmm. uh, most of the types of radiation you get mm-hmm. the general ones you're worried about on a, a nuclear system would be gamma radiation which is probably the worst one uh, beta radiation which is not super bad your skin can stop beta radiation so generally speaking you don't really have an issue with that one and then uh, alpha radiation would be the most dangerous if it didn't get stopped by literally everything. In fact, Mm -hmm. one of the ways we check for the presence of alpha radiation when we're doing surveys is we will hold something, a radiac, a Geiger counter, towards a uh, piece of something. We're wondering if it's radioactive. And then if we want to check if it's alphas, we put a sheet of printer paper in between the Mm -hmm. sensor and the the substance. Mm -hmm. And if it stops making any noise, it was alphas. Mm -hmm. It's it's that easy to stop alpha radiation. Mm -hmm. A piece of paper will do it. So... Generally, we're worried about betas, but the the shielding we use is more or less just a bunch of water and some uh, what's it called uh, lead. So and it, and it it does a great job. Like I said, we get so so little radiation in the plant, uh, even during the highest of power operations, that it's really a non-issue. Roger, um, as kind of a follow up to this, I'm not sure if we can answer this in any useful way, but if there is a fuel leak, and I guess that means in terms of radioactivity, how long until the ship is dangerous to stay on? I don't think there's any way of answering that, but anything you've got to comment on that? Um, even if the fuel, um, I mean, it's kind of an odd. It is. It's, it's just not way really... to, it, it, Yeah, so fuel leak doesn't really describe it correctly. Mm. What we would most likely have is a release of fission products, which is just uh, as uranium f- fissions and produces power and neutrons and whatever, does what it does, uh, you get the atoms from the uranium will split into smaller atoms, and those atoms are usually radioactive. If those start to get into the primary water, that can be an issue. However, the shielding system, again, 
handles it. I mean, there's really no issue there as far as the ship being dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way the ship would get dangerous to stay on is if the shielding system started to lose their water, and mm -hmm. that's extremely unlikely. There's not really anything going on in the shielding systems other than water in a tank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Roger. Um, now the next one, I'd like to answer a whole bunch of questions in one because it's quite an important one. The official question is, is the reactor lasting the whole lifespan of the vessel? And I'd like to uh, pin that with, can the reactors be removed? Are they ever removed or are they one fit and that's it? Uh, so the reactor itself, the vessel will be with the ship the entire lifespan of the vessel. Uh, the fuel inside can be changed, as we've discussed. We do refuel once. We've already done it. Um, there's not really a reason you'd ever remove the reactor vessel unless the ship had an issue where there was damage to a reactor vessel mm -hmm. and they needed to replace it. And if that happens, there's a good chance that ship is going to be down for several years and it may end up being cheaper to just mm -hmm. replace it with a newer ship. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they're built around their reactors, isn't it? Uh, we do own the bottom two thirds of the ship for the majority of the ship, as far as the plants and the reactors go. So, uh, I mean, there's certainly a lot of the ship, uh, and it's it's pretty unlikely that we would ever actually replace the entire vessel. Uh, mostly because the likelihood of it getting damaged is extremely. Mm -hmm. Just out of interest, um, but do you know the size of your fission rods? Um, you say fission, you mean the you control mean, rods? Yeah, control rods, yeah. Oh, sorry. So okay, so the control rods are, are made of a neutron absorbing material. They're not the ones with the fuel in them. Those are the things we can oh, move okay. up and down. Yeah. And then the actual fuel rods are uh, roughly the same size as the control rods. Uh, they're just kind of wrapped around the control rods. Okay. And as far as the size go, again, think a school bus, just remove the, the cab. Roger. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, what is the temperature in the reactor's core and what is considered a safe level? Interesting, not the foggiest. <laughs> so I wrote off to the side of this one in the notes, mm -hmm. OPSEC, I can't discuss temperatures uh, specifically. I can say it's really hot, it's but really, I can't talk about I mean, numbers. just generally, not uh, ignoring aircraft carriers at the moment, is there a general temperature that we know about for just civilian ones? Is it hundreds of degrees, thousands of degrees? Uh, so for pressurized water reactors, it's hundreds of degrees. Uh, I think the uh, Three Mile Island was around 600 degrees mm -hmm. Fahrenheit on normal operating. Mm -hmm. um, and then they, when they had their issues, they climbed up well above 800, 900 mm -hmm. uh, degrees, which is why they had their issues. Um, but they did fix mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Um, does the crew on the bridge have any remote control over the reactors, or is it just your team on the controls directly? Uh, so the bridge does not have any direct control over the reactor. The only thing they have is, uh, so you, if you think of a uh, speedboat throttle, right, your typical mm -hmm. civilian uh, small boat, you got the little push forward, pull backwards type deal. We have one of those up on the bridge. What they do is they push it where they would like the, the speed of the boat to be, and then they hit a button and it rings a bell downstairs. And we see that. It changes on a, on a, a, a screen we have, right? And uh, it'll tell us, like, hey, they want us to go, say, a head full. Um, and it'll make a little noise to let us know that they changed the bell. So then we have to actually go ahead and answer a head full. But they have zero direct control of what's happening downstairs. It's all uh, our team. We have three different control spaces to take care of everything. Roger. And, and kind of on the same thing there, uh, in terms of maintaining the reactor on a daily basis, would you say it's mostly automated and you guys are mainly monitoring? Is that how it would be? Um, uh, I think you mean operations, really? Yeah, oper as yeah far that's as... what I mean. In, in daily okay. operations, is a computer controlling it, and you guys are mainly monitoring on a daily, daily, yeah, operation. Uh, so everything that happens with the plant is monitored by a computer system, hmm. but all of the actual actions taken, as far as if a if a rod's going to move or hmm. a throttle's going to open to make the ship go faster, that is all manual. We hmm. There are systems in place to like make it easier, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. we're not going to go turn a, val a gigantic valve to al allow more steam into the, the engine. Mm -hmm. But there's a guy sitting at a control panel. He's got a throttle in front of him. And when he moves that, it moves the, th the valves by the, the throttle valves by the uh, the engine. So everything is actually controlled by a human. The only the main thing the computers do is monitor things and then insert corrective or protective features whenever something bad might mm -hmm. be happening or we're getting close to doing something unsafe. Right, so especially the opposite way that I thought is, is humans essentially operating and the computer monitoring. That's interesting. Okay, very good. Um, when, when was the DN-68 uh, laid down? Sorry, I forgot. Uh, 
I want to say around the 50s or 60s. I'd wow. have to Google it. Really? Uh, Cap, Cap, actually, I sent you a DM with that information. Roger. Uh, that's going to be you. Wow, 1968. And so it boggles the mind how old that thing is, isn't it? So it's only 50 years old. It's 50 years old. That's crazy. Yeah. And that thing's still going. Do we know when it's getting scrapped, or I don't mean? I guess we don't. Know. Uh, we we have at least four or five more years left in that. Wow, a 50, a fifty year old rack reactor just blasting around. I can't believe it, can you? It's the technology they had then must have been so different to what we have now. Uh, we did do an upgrade. We switched mm -hmm. from uh, lollipop analog gauges mm -hmm. to more digital systems, so we have mm -hmm. some nicer stuff now. But uh, generally speaking, yes, everything on that ship is about fifty years. Roger. So those are the original reactors. Everything is, always boggles the mind that in every time you look at a nuclear reactor, that's the re original reactor. You know, all those reactors you've got on mainland America, they were, they were all 1950s, aren't they? So they're 70 years old in some cases. No one's ever no been thanks inside to of them. Greenpeace. Yeah, no one's ever been inside of them. No one's ever changed anything. It's just been sitting there for 70 years doing its thing. Boggles the mind. Yeah, yeah it's real well, comforting. One comment there, they do change the fuel out. Um, mm -hmm. There's almost no civilian reactors that have not been refueled at this mm -hmm. point in the uh, United States. They do, we do have to re -re refuel them, but all that involves really is opening up the top after it gets nice and not radioactive, mm -hmm. uh, still taking a bunch of extra precautions, and then you just pull out the old fuel, put new fuel in, and resume work. Mm -hmm. More job. Very good. Okay, there's punch roll, guys. Uh, this one I don't really get because obviously all of this is connected, but are the reactors directly connected to the steam plant and the propulsion plant? I think what this person was getting at, if I'm interpreting it correctly, was it, are we a direct boiling reactor? Which would mean that the uh, steam is being produced inside the reactor vessel itself, um, which is how Chernobyl was designed. That's why they had so many issues. Mm -hmm. uh, because once things went wrong, they uh, were just releasing hot steam mm -hmm. that was full of radioactive particles. Mm -hmm. Anyway... Um, so our system is pressurized water reactor. I did link that infographic mm -hmm. to yep. make things a bit easier for people to understand. Um, if you look at it, there's a system of water that goes through the reactor itself and then goes to a boiler. And then that boiler water is what actually generates the steam and then goes off to do the work. So you're not Ours is the same way. Mm -hmm. it, is not, it is not directly connected, if I had to answer the question mm -hmm. uh, word for word. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the primary system. We have secondary system. The secondary system has all the steam and all the dangerous, or the not, like, is what goes to all the things. And all that water is very clean, very not radioactive. In fact, it's almost never any radioactive at all. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the primary plant is where all the water that touches the reactor core is, and that stuff does not ever leave the primary system. Roger. It stays where it is, and it, and it lives there forever. So that was a really dangerous system they had in Chernobyl then, wasn't it? You say that, but then we still use boiling water reactors mm. in the U.S. right now. Um, the difference is they, there are some very uh, important differences in the core construction and the construction of the control rods, uh, as well as what they use as their moderator is one of the terms that is uh, specific to nuclear reactor cores. Uh, Chernobyl used graphite moderators and had graphite tips on their control rods, which both increase reactivity whenever you have uh, graphite around. Mm -hmm. We use water in all of ours now. Moderator is always water. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the uh, tips of the control rods are no longer made of something that makes the power go up, because that doesn't seem like a very good idea, as you might imagine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so around, those yeah. the the issues that they had and what caused their problems and their, that what caused their explosion are non-existent in mm -hmm. civilian plants or our plants. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, um, is your job physical in nature or more like lots of buttons and calculations? So I'm one of the mechanics. Uh, machinist mate is essentially the Navy's term for mechanic. Uh, my job is very physical in nature. I do a lot of taking things apart, turning valves, uh, turning pumps on and off, which is a little button switchy kind of stuff. But most of mine is is definitely physical in nature. The electronic technicians, uh, the ETs as we call them, which are typically uh, the nerdier of the nukes, uh, they, are, they do actually do a lot of buttons and calculations. A lot of their maintenance Whereas mine might be take this pump apart, rotate it a little bit, check and make sure the bearing's good, maybe check on some of the, the ceiling between the shaft and the outside so that the water doesn't leak out. Theirs would be plug a laptop into this big computer array and make sure everything's working correctly. Roger. Yeah, okay. Uh, what do you like most about your job, and generally, do you enjoy it? Uh, I like my friends the most, uh, the guys I work with. Uh, they're really good people. We hang out as much as we can, especially when we're uh, in foreign ports or just not at home, really. 
uh lots of good dudes uh a few good females uh <laughs> um but yeah i mean it's the people it, it always is the people in the military as you'll hear from almost everyone you ever asked that question it's always the people mm-hmm. um and as far as liking my job goes i do not like how little free time i get i'm one of those people who likes my free time but uh it's, it's okay um I, I keep my eye on the prize which is after i'm done with uh the navy which uh i'm gonna do about nine years most likely uh, my job opportunities outside of the Navy will be excellent. And so I try to keep that in ha- that in mind and, and focus on that more than how much I don't like what I'm doing at the moment. Roger. Okay, well, we'll miss the first half of the next question out. But the second half is interesting. How is the reactor connected to the propulsion system? Do those Does that pressurized steam pump the turbines directly? Or is there a, a, another link in the system? It does. Uh, we have most of what we do with the steam is put it through turbines. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing we do is obviously send it up to the accumulators to launch planes. Mm-hmm. But uh, yes, uh, from the boilers, there is a bunch of pipes. And as long as the valves are open, the steam has the ability to flow to the turbines for the main engines, mm-hmm. as well as the turbines that generate electricity. Some of the pumps are turbines. Um, but yeah, the, the steam just goes to the turbine and is uh, based on how open the inlet valve is, mm-hmm. is, how much steam will be able to flow. And it just goes in and spins the turbine. And that spins the propeller. Regards the the you know the movement, the kinetic uh, turbines are they then just somehow clutched clutched to the prop shafts to the propellers, or is there is, is there something else that's more complex than that? Uh, we have a series of reduction gears that just mm-hmm. reduce the the ratio of revolution. So the mm-hmm. turbines spin quite fast, and the propellers obviously don't spin quite so fast. Mm-hmm. So we use a large set of gears to reduce the speed. Uh, which does the normal thing that reducing and gear ratios do for you. You can spin something really fast, and then as you reduce the gear ratio down, you have more torque and less revolutions at the lower speeds. So that's what we use. Roger, very good. Uh, Does the ship store energy somewhere when the capacity of the reactors are not used to the full? Does it mean electricity in terms of energy? That's all I can think of. It doesn't really make sense. Do you have like a large Um, massive capacitor somewhere? I don't think you do, but... So I think what they're getting at is, uh, like, so I think there's obviously the issue where people don't quite understand the intricacies of how the reactor plants mm-hmm. work. But uh, we talked about it before, and I'm going to keep saying it until, it until it goes away, but reactor power follows steam demand. So if whatever we're asking for is what mm-hmm. the reactor gives us, and it mm-hmm. gives us no extra, and it gives us no less. So it's it's a very efficient system as a result. Um, so there's no need to store any energy that's not being used mm-hmm. because there isn't any energy not being used. So by virtue of the design, there isn't excess megawatts being chucked out basically correct so let's say we're operating at 50 percent capacity then the the plants are only generating 150 of the 300 mm-hmm. megawatts that's because that's all we need right now if we need more it'll adjust itself to take up that well jeff very good uh next one's interesting can you run the entire carrier on one reactor and they uh or or not uh, so yes, uh, obviously not to the fullest capacity. Mm-hmm. We can't answer the the fastest bell and mm-hmm. go real fast through the water and still launch planes all the time. Uh, that would be an issue. Uh, you'd probably uh, overload that single reactor. However, uh, it's very capable of going a speed and launching planes with one reactor. Um, so we can actually do quite a bit on just one. I've I've seen us go one reactor while launching planes before. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. Are you the when you get to port? Are you the last team to leave the boat um, due to powering down and whatnot, or is that not accurate? Or do some people not even leave the boat? <laughs> we are the first ones on and the last ones off every time. <laughs> Anytime we uh, have a you know we're about to leave port, let's say we're leaving in a couple of days, uh, two days or so before, we will start coming on board in teams to get everything set up and start starting up the plants. Uh, and it depends on what we're doing in port. If we're pulling in for 24 hours, we're probably not going to shut down the plants. Um, but if we're pulling in for you know a month and a half, of course, we're going to shut everything down, hook up to the shore. Um, but it, it does leave us with being the last ones to leave. And we also tend to leave in shifts because we can't ever leave the plants completely unattended. When we shut down, we can reduce our manning quite a lot, almost in half. But we still have to leave some people behind to watch everything, make sure nothing bad's going on, and make sure everything's staying safe. Roger, excellent. Um, I'm going to start skipping ones now because I've only got a few minutes before I get in trouble with the boss um, at this point. But uh, how did you find the Reapers? DCS tutorials. And let me, <laughs> let me no, pass I'd... you the compliment <laughs> that you've gotten significantly better in your mm. video making and your tutorial Roger. creation than you used to. Roger, what planes have you got then? 
Um, I have all the modern uh, fighter jets. So I've got the Hornet, I've got the Tomcat, I have the Harrier, one of my favorites. I have the A-10. The A-10 was my first module. Mm -hmm. um, I have all the helicopters. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing... I had the Vigan. The Vigan's pretty cool. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing at least one of them, but uh, generally just those. I'm not super into the World War II, and I'm not super mm -hmm. into the older technology planes like the Vietnam ones, so I don't have things like the F-5 or any of them. Bloody millennial. <laughs> uh, do, you, <laughs> do you ever get to see the captain? <laughs> uh, we can tell a fun story about that if you want. Um, I have seen the captain several times. Um, I did get in trouble uh, at one point while I was on the ship. Uh, and one of the way the Navy handles people doing dumb things is mm -hmm. they send them to the captain. And the captain decides, I'm going to do this to you or I'm going to do that to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't quite make it all the way to the captain in my disciplinary case. Um, what I was in trouble for was uh, having a electronic cigarette or a vaporizer on board the ship. That's not allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, it was found, and I went to what we call... Uh, Master Chief Review Board, or Disciplinary Review Board, which is where all the Master Chiefs come and they yell at you and tell you how stupid you are for doing something dumb. Um, and then uh, you go to the uh, the next step is the XO. Uh, so it's XO's uh, investigation, XOI, or it might be instruction, I'm not sure. Either way, uh, you go, so you go to XOI, and uh, he was like, look, I think you did this as a mistake. Uh, I don't think it should affect your career, so I'm going to dismiss it, and you're going to have this punishment. So it stopped there. But the next thing you would have gone to is... Uh, Daishul? I can't... Daishi? Yeah, okay. Somebody in the Twitch chat is uh, talking about it. But yes, the next thing you would go to is Captain's Master or Non-Judicial Punishment, and he would have assigned me a punishment that he saw fit had I gone that far. I was very lucky that the XO was feeling lenient and dismissed it at that point, though. Right. But the, the Captain's around the ship all the time. He does all hands calls where everybody will come out to the hangar bay and he'll talk to us. Uh, he talks over the, the announcing system all the time, and it's not uncommon at all to see him walking around. Roger. Um, what happens when the ship's retired? What do they do with the reactors? Or do we know? Do we even know? Is we uh, <laughs> no, we've gotten that far. They uh, they let them cool down. They pull them out. Uh, mostly the fuel. They pull the fuel out and they take it somewhere and bury it. Uh, as far as the reactor vessels, they usually just get. Marja, what is the nuclear power? What is the nuclear power pipeline? Of course, does that mean something to you? It does. The, so the pipeline is what we call our training program. Uh, it consists of that A-school, nuclear power school, and prototype training that I've talked about in uh, my, my synopsis up there. Uh, so A-school is just your job school. So as a mechanic, you go to mechanics A-school, which they just teach you about how turbines work, how uh, pumps work. You learn some math on how those things function, things like that. Uh, the power school is where you learn the intricacies of an actual nuclear reactor. They teach you about how things work in the core, how things work uh, in the the rest of the plant. So how you would how you use what's happening in the core to generate hot uh, water, which then generates steam. What you do with the steam, those kind of things. That's that's probably the most difficult part of the pipeline. And then uh, the prototype training, you actually go to an old retired submarine. Um, we, the one I trained on was the uh, SSN 635 uh, Sam Rayburn, I believe. And uh, it's, it was an old uh, nuclear uh, missile submarine back in the Cold War, but now it sits at a pier and never moves. And uh, it's in Charleston, South Carolina is where those are. Um, but yeah, so that prototype is just you go to a, a submarine and you pretend like you're assigned to that submarine and you do, do what you do when you get to the fleet. You just qualify to stand some watch and learn about stuff. Very good. We've got Daiyushi on comms. Uh, I know it's a bit unprofessional, but I've literally run out of time, but I don't want to cut uh, Snooky Dog. Can you... Take my place, please. We're starting at what exactly is the reactor's fuel? Did you see, to see that one? So what exactly is the reactor's fuel? I'm guessing that must mean the fuel rods. Mm -hmm. I assume so. Uh, we touched on it just a hair earlier, but we used extremely enriched uranium-235. Dude, like, I know a little bit about nuclear reactors, but it's like, uh, I know there's, like, different isotopes, and that one... Oh... Uh... <laughs> That's the good one. It's the very reactive one. And uh, when you enrich it like we have, it does technically become weapons grade. However, I would like to clarify that because the reactor's fuel is weapons grade does not mean that it has any explosive potential like a nuclear bomb. Okay. Those things function extremely differently, and you need something to set off the nuclear reaction in a bomb that does not exist in the reactor core. So it is the same material, but not for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more designed to like burn it all at once rather than it being a, a slow burn. Even if you were to completely remove the control rod, stop cooling the, the reactor core, and like l just let it wild, right, like you would with a bomb, it's not actually going to explode, it's just going to melt into a big molten ball of sadness that releases lots and lots of radiation. And uh, you don't want to be around that, but it's not going to just all of a sudden detonate and cause a, nu a nuclear explosion. That's not even physically possible. Okay, um, 
Okay, I guess we could move the 52 then. Okay, what is the future of nu nuclear reactors in your opinion? Smaller, simpler, more stable and cheap? Uh, so it will be smaller and simpler, and it will be more stable. Granted, the stable part, uh, they're extremely stable now. There's not really any issues these days as far as stability goes, uh, because everybody tends to use pressurized water reactors. Um, it, it really just works. I mean, uh, like th that that old adage. It's really it's probably annoying to hear it again, but since reactor power follows steam demand, you really like they do their own thing, man. I mean, the only thing we really do is we move the control rods to make sure that the water stays hot enough. Is there something I, I can add to that question real quick? Sure, uh, go ahead. Um, with the recent advancements in this, uh, any possibility of going cold? Was that cold fusion? Yes, affirmative. Uh, I'm not too familiar with cold fusion to start, um, but I would say that the likelihood of the Navy switching to fusion at all in any near future is extremely low, mostly because of the power required to start a fusion reaction. From what I, I do know about fusion, uh, it requires immense power to start the reaction for fusion because you have to generate a ball of plasma. Um, I don't see the Navy doing that because our startup is quite simple. We just pull the rods out. It doesn't really require anything crazy going on. Um, whereas having to drain all that electricity from the grid to start up a mm -hmm. fusion reactor pr kind of precludes starting up outside of being like tied to the pier. That's and I don't, I don't, I don't see them taking that until it's a lot more. It's a problem with fusion. Isn't developed. It? Yeah, it takes more power from the grid than you actually give back to it. And plus, it even and it takes more energy to to maintain the reactor's containment field because as that cold fusion reaction starts, it wants to heat up because you're basically creating a miniature sun inside that reactor. It wants to heat up. Well, right, so I don't mm -hmm. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Actually, I wanted to expand on that too. Do you think they might do thorium in the future? Uh, so thorium salt has a, a lot of cool things going on with it. I do know I have just a hair. I mean, by no means what I know about my stuff, but a hair more about thorium. Um, if that technology progresses the way it has been and continues to do so, there I would say there's a chance that the Navy would switch to that long down the line, though. I mean, we're talking after our, our lifetimes here. Uh, it would be a very long time before they switch their fuels because we certainly have a, a bunch of uranium laying around that we are more than happy to turn into reactor fuel for our boats. Okay, then. Um, that's about all I could think. Like, I'd only other thing I can think of is like a knack reactor, but I don't think that's the same thing. So, I guess we could move on to 54. What's the minimum safety distance you can come to an active reactor? Uh, so, as long as you remain outside the shielding, so the, essentially the, the big room that the reactor is sitting in, as long as you're outside of that, you're fine. Um, even when you get close to that thing, there's really not that much radiation happening. Uh, we do have a, a cute little red line painted around to show us like hey you should stay on the other side of this if you can it's by no means a restriction to us as as the workers in this space uh, we are more than welcome to go on the other side of that in fact we have to a lot of the time uh, the idea is stay on the further away side of that line when you can and it's just because the the radiation level there is a slight bit higher to the point that if you stood there all the time you might get 15 millirim this year instead of 10 I mean, it's, it's literally very little. It, it's just to avoid anomalies where somebody's been hanging out right there and they get more than everybody else. Yeah, do you guys also use, like, um, I remember when I was on the ship, they had, like, uh, these, it's not exactly like a Geiger counter thing, but do you guys keep those with you down there, too? I was wondering. Uh, the the way what we call them is radiax is probably the right term. Uh, we have a few different types for doing different things, measuring different things. We got one for measuring neutron flux, which is just how many neutrons are flying around. Uh, we've got ones that are that are better at doing alphas, and then we've got some for general beta gamma radiation detection. Uh, they're all over the place. Um, they're available. We have spe specific personnel, uh, engineering laboratory technicians. They do all of the work with the radiax for the most part, so we leave it to them, generally speaking. Um, they're there. They're used. A lot of times they find nothing is the, the fun part about it. Uh, they, they spend a lot of time doing all these surveys and, and checking and making sure everything's safe and almost every single time they find absolutely nothing which is comforting honestly but yeah with radiation you can't really be too safe with it i always remember hearing about how there'd be so many checklists that you'd have to go through with some of those procedures um okay so the next question would be what happens after you decide to enlist in the navy what are the steps and restrictions 
Uh, so, uh, first of all, whatever you're doing when you're enlisting, uh, definitely get everything in writing. Actually read the things you're signing. Uh, too many people join. Don't read things. Just start signing. Um, believe the the air quotes guarantees that their recruiter gives them. Uh, your recruiter probably won't ever lie to you. That's a big uh, myth. I don't think the recruiters ever lie. They just insinuate that you're going to get better things than you likely will because someone else got them once. Uh, it, it really does depend on what job you're picking as to what you're going to get as far as incentives like enlistment bonuses and re-enlistment bonuses. Uh, my job in particular has very high enlistment bonuses and re-enlistment bonuses, but unless you actually get the job, you're entitled to exactly none of those things. And it will be in paper written down on a piece of, like a document that you sign before you get any of those things. And there's usually a catch. You usually don't get money for free. So for our enlistment bonus that we get, you have to actually finish the school pipeline, which is not a simple process. It's essentially a year of school in six months each time you go to a school. So a, a college level school at that. So you're, you're definitely having to work to get that money and it's not something they're just gonna hand you. And anytime you do something that jeopardizes the rest of your career, you will lose anything you've given the Navy or the Navy's given you. So if you, let's say, make it all the way through the pipeline for training and you, you get all that extra money for enlisting and then you just do something stupid like get a DUI or like, you know, have a drunk driving accident and kill somebody, if they kick you out of the Navy, you owe them all that money back. You don't just get to keep it. So definitely be smart when you're doing things in the Navy. Definitely read everything and definitely uh, get things in writing because otherwise don't expect them. But as far as what happens after you enlist, uh, you'll you know you'll go to your recruiting station. You'll talk to the recruiter. You'll he'll talk to you about jobs. Uh, you'll go take the test, the ASVAB. You probably already taken it in high school, uh, most likely in the U.S. Uh, we do that a lot. Uh, once you have decided on a job, it's not actually your job until you go to a military entrance processing uh, services facility, which is on MEPS facility. Um, when you go there, you'll talk to a detailer who is going to give you the options of jobs that are available. If the job you want isn't available that day, tell them you won't take any of the other jobs. If you're actually set on a job, refuse to join until you get the job you want. They will give it to you eventually. You may have to go to MEPS two or three times and your recruiter will probably be upset that he has to take you back over and over. But you're, like him being upset isn't your problem. You should be focused on getting what you want out of the military and, and not uh, falling victim to the, the, the little ploys that they use to try and get people to sign things and do things that aren't exactly what they want. Granted, like, you're not going to be in a bad situation if you just take a job. If you just want to join and just take a job, by all means. But if there's a specific job that you want to do, fight for it and refuse to do anything else because they will just switch it up on you and be like, yeah, yeah, just take this one and we'll get you to the other one later. That might not happen. You may not ever get to switch back to the job you want. So definitely get what you want the first time in writing and read your contract. You're going to drive the person who's handling your contract signing absolutely up the wall when you actually read your contracts. It's going to take you about an hour and they're trying to get through a bunch of people, but it's it's worth your time. Read what's in there because you have no idea what you're signing if you don't read it, and it is very, very binding, and you are signing yourself to follow a lot of uh, extra rules. Like, so we have the Uniform Code of Military Justice. You're signing a piece of paper that says that once you go in, you will follow all those extra laws. Those are laws to you now. They don't affect civilians, but they do affect you. So just, just read everything. That's the biggest thing. Don't be silly. You're signing contracts that affect your life. Yeah, hey, I want to... I wanted to add to the selective reenlistment bonus. I remember the my recruiter is trying to get me into uh, getting into a submarine, but I kind of decided against it. But they do try to use that as um, encouragement to get to get people in the rates that aren't as maybe popular or maybe a little make pe people feel a little squeamish. So, so that's what that's usually for. The reason they have a uh, selective reenlistment bonus for the nuclear navy is uh, the amount of uh, just like work that has to get done in the nuclear side of things. We definitely work very hard. We're up at all hours in the night doing things. Your watch could be any time of the day. It could be in the middle of the night, right in the middle of when you want to sleep. Uh, we have one of the lowest quality of lives. It's not the lowest. Uh, keep in mind that there's people like the culinary specialists, so like the, the guys who make your food. They work about as hard as we do, and people don't give them a lot of credit which isn't really fair, because they, they bust their ass all the time. They are really, they're up 24-7 making food, man. It's it's not a good time. So there, there are some jobs that are terrible. The difference is CSs don't get SRBs. So they don't they don't get a big reenlistment bonus if they decide to extend their contract, whereas I'm getting ready to do mine soon, and, and the, the person I have, my career counselor, which is just somebody on board who 
helps you out with uh, as far as reenlisting goes. Which, by the way, once you get into the Navy, the people who are telling you things about your future as far as your career goes are probably not telling you anything that isn't true and going to happen because they have no incentive to do so. It doesn't affect them or their numbers or any of their job stuff to tell you something that isn't true or is maybe an uh, embellishment of what is true. So you can usually trust what they're saying. Uh, he's telling me it should be around $60,000 for when I reenlist, which is nice, right? I get you know sixty grand for staying in for an extra three years, which is cool. I would yeah. like to add something on the SRB if you don't mind. Oh, go for it. Uh, just I'm I'm retired. You uh, USAF. It's just to put that out there. Not that it really matters, but um, the one thing with the SRB, what is determines the SRB in most cases, it's the Manning uh, for that specific career field, and this is across all branches of U, uh, U.S. military. And if there's a low, um, a shortage in a specific career field and it gets down below a certain point, then they will start to offer SRBs for that career field to get people to re-enlist. Or if it's low enough during enlistment, they'll offer um, an enlistment bonus for that career field. And the l higher the shortage is determines um, the amount or the uh, not only that, it's also a determination of the retention of that career field as well. Because some career fields have very high retention, and other ones have almost no retention. Meaning people hit their four year, four or six years, and they're gone. So they want to try keep people in because they need to keep the experience there. So that determines a lot on the SRBs as well. Yep, you're absolutely right, and that's part of the reason ours is, is decent in the nuclear field. Um, the people tend to do one reenlistment if they do any, and then they're out. So you typically get between eight and nine years, to maybe ten, out of uh, most of the nuclear sailors. Uh, we also have a six-year contract initially. Not that you sign a six-year contract, just so everybody's aware, you actually sign an eight-year contract in the U.S. They just don't tell you that. Uh, it's four years of active duty and four years of uh, inactive reserve. Um, and that's almost every single contract that's very standard, so don't freak out when you read that. Um, that is normal. Uh, but the, the retention rate in our, our field is very low after the first reenlistment. So the first reenlistment, you tend to get less money. The second reenlistment, you tend to max out your SRB, which is uh, around 110 or 120 right now, I think. $1,000. Um, and as well, there's under, we're undermanned significantly, especially the mechanics. We are so undermanned that we actually have people who have never gone through nuclear power training that are conventional mechanics. So they are just machinist mates, not nuclear machinist mates, that work with us in the plant. They aren't allowed to touch any of the reactor-specific stuff, but they work in the steam plant with us, and they do a lot of the work with us as well, which really sucks for them because they don't get any of the benefits of being nuclear like all the SRBs and the enlistment bonuses and the, you know, the, the job title when you leave the Navy that gives you a good foot in the door for a lot of different careers, but they do the exact same work we do. Could I add uh, add a question to what he just said there, Dash? Um, go ahead. When you're talking the benefits are, what kind of actual pay benefit-wise uh, do you get besides your base pay, your COLA, your housing, uh, your VHA, BHA, whichever it is now? Uh, do you get anything in addition to that? Uh, like hazard pay or anything along that lines? Sure. So we don't receive any hazardous duty pay um, as our spot because the plant's actually pretty safe, uh, it turns out. We do get uh, special duty pay, which amounts to around $300 a month after you've been in for four years, I think. And then obviously you get your sea pay in the Navy. So anytime you're on a sea command, like I am with a ship that actually will leave port, you get sea pay as well. But that's everybody on the boat, not just my rate. Uh, we also, uh, when you get to a certain level of qualification in our uh, qu qualifications path, which is just something you, you study and you take some tests and you, you talk to some people that are more senior to you and prove that you know what you're talking about with X, usually watch stations for us. So, like, I know how to work the turbine generators, right? Something like that. Uh, when you get to the supervisory level, your uh, special assignment pay goes to special assignment supervisory pay, which steps it up to around $650 a month, which is a pretty hefty chunk of money. Uh, to have extra coming in, which is nice. And then everything else is pretty standard. Uh, as you listed, BAH, base pay, all that good stuff. Uh, all that's obviously there. Okay, yeah. Um, I guess one last thing I wanted to add to that is that one of the parts about just military in general is that it's going to have ebbs and flows, so you might have an easier time at some points when they need more enlistment because it's like they, they'll they oftentimes go where they don't have enough people and then they might have too much in all the services, so that might play into things a bit too. Um, 
Anything else for that one? Okay, so, uh, okay, number five. What is heavy water, and is it the reactor's cold? So heavy water is just water molecules that have extra neutrons. So if, if you if you look at what a water molecule is, it's a hydrogen atom and two oxygen atoms. Uh, oxygen is normally a uh, it's at oxygen uh, 16 or 18 I think one of the two. Either way, it's got between uh, eight and nine uh, neutrons in it, and then hydrogen has uh, no neutron in its uh, in its uh, nucleus. So typically, heavy water is a uh, hydrogen atom will have absorbed a neutron into its nucleus. And it'll still be the same water molecule. It'll still be one hydrogen, two oxygen. Or two hydrogen, one oxygen. I'm sorry. Wow. Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, anyhow, so the hydrogen atoms will have absorbed a neutron, and that makes it heavy water, uh, big air quotes. Uh, we do not use that specifically as reactor coolant. There were some reactors for a while that tested using it that way. The reason you would want to do this is the, the hydrogen molecules that have absorbed a neutron into them are more likely to release that neutron if one of the neutrons released from the fission in the core hits that uh, hydrogen atom. It'll knock that extra neutron loose. So you get free neutrons, essentially, is, is why people liked the idea of it. Uh, it turns out you really don't need that, especially when you have such enriched fuel like we do. So it's uh, a non-issue at all. We don't use it. Uh, deuterium is a hydrogen atom that, is, that has absorbed a neutron. That does exist naturally in water, and we do have some of that on board, obviously, and it does account for some of the reactivity in the core, and we do take it into consideration. But that's about as far as heavy water goes as far uh, in any of the nuclear plants. Okay. Do you have a call sign or nickname on board and a story behind it? Uh, I do not. Uh, call signs are definitely a pilot thing. I'll say that. Uh, nicknames, of course, could exist. Uh, I don't personally have one. I haven't done anything, I think, uh, funny or stupid enough yet to uh, warrant a nickname but uh we, do, we, we don't i don't think anyone refers to them as call signs outside of the pilot community that's really a pilot thing uh but yeah not nothing nothing for me okay let's say it's a brand new reactor but no fuel in it what steps to active what steps are there to activate it and how long will it be until it outputs any power uh so a brand new reactor is going to have uh, very 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 little uh, radiation or reactivity happening inside of its core. Um, but there will be just a little bit. Um, we call them intrinsic uh, neutrons or source neutrons, um, which are what exists naturally without any uranium-235 fission happening. And it usually comes from the other stuff that happens to be the other 5% of the fuel that isn't actually just pure uranium-235. That stuff is different uh, large atoms that are generally unstable. And at some point, they will fission and release neutrons, or at least decay in some way, whether that's beta minus decay, alpha decay. Um, and they will release particles, which will then go on to cause other, uh, or not neutrons, but uh, atoms to do something, whether that's release an atom, uh, release a neutron, do some other kind of uh, fission and or uh, decay. And uh, we use that to start to get some of the uranium to fission. And once that happens, you start to... Uh, get your normal uh, nuclear reactor things to happen. You get up, up to where you're actually producing power with the reactor. Uh, to do that, we just spend a really long time slowly pulling the control rods out, little by little, until uh, we start to see the power increase. And then from there, it operates like it normally does. Yeah, so yeah, it's just a slow thing just to make sure everything's working properly. It's more that uh, in the lower power ranges like that, uh, we have something we call startup rate, which is... Uh, how fast power is changing. Uh, it's really easy to get startup rate to soar to an extremely high number um, very, very quickly if you're not careful. So we just take it nice and easy and slow so that doesn't happen. Um, it's really just a safety thing. We don't want uh, power to climb out of control too quickly. That can cause all of the bad things that have happened previously and uh, all the other reactors that you've heard about from different things. Uh, usually it's because power gets too high. So we just avoid that altogether by going really slow. Um, so for the last one that's on here is, do you ever see the sunlight of the main deck? Are you allowed to go out when there are no jets in operation? Uh, you certainly are allowed to go out on the flight deck when there's no jets in operation. Uh, like I said, you're, uh, there's not really anywhere on the ship that you can't go. Um, any place that's got a job specific purpose. So the plants are a, bit, a good example because it's a lot of the ship or the nuclear plants. Uh, you can't go down there unless you have business down there, particularly if you're not wearing one of our little dosimeters. Um, 
other than that, as a result, there's not really anywhere on the ship that I can't go besides some of the more more top secret or classified spaces for things like intelligence or combat systems, where they have like different computer systems or maybe like uh, we have a place called the Vault, that uh, is where the guys who do any kind of intercepting of enemy communications and then try to decrypt it and translate it. Those guys hang out in there. Obviously, I can't go in there. I have no business in there. Just like you know, the guy cooking my food isn't allowed to come down to the reactor plant because he has no business down there. But other than that, I mean, anywhere that's not dangerous for you to be, you're allowed to go. So we can go to the flight deck whenever we want, as long as there aren't planes going on. If there are planes going on, we just go up to the the Vultures Row, which is on the 09. It's the same level as the bridge on the uh, the superstructure there, the island, as we call it. And uh, you can just hang out there. There's plenty of sun right there. You get to watch the planes. It's very loud. You have to have double hearing protection on. You have to get at least uh, 40 decibels of uh, noise reduction. Otherwise, you could cause serious damage to your hearing. Uh as much as we like to look at the outside of our planes in DCS and hang out, mm-hmm. um, you guys have no fucking concept. <laughs> Apologies for my cursing. There's no, there's no way to describe how loud a, a full afterburner takeoff is on mm-hmm. a flight deck when with the blast shield up. It is incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> it, you, you're standing probably 150 yards away, you know, 60 feet above the the, the plane, mm-hmm. and the jet blast deflector will direct extremely hot gas right into your face. And you, you have that happening while you're listening to this roaring engine build up power, and it's it's incredible. It's definitely a, a humbling uh, experience. And words will never do it justice. All right, guys. I agree. It's something that's worth experiencing. If you guys ever get the chance, they do do some stuff every once in a while called uh, Tiger Cruises with the carriers, where they let civilians on board to ride along, and they awesome. will always, always, always have at least a few guys with some planes to go out there and just show you guys flight ops so you can that would be cool. One day. One yeah. guy on the bucket list. Okay, thank you for filling in, Doshi. Sorry about having to run off. It's just uh, because I'm an idiot. I double booked today. That's just the kind of thing I do. Uh, Snooky, that was friggin' awesome. Um, I must admit, I wasn't I wasn't really sure about today. I thought, ooh, naval guy, you know, doesn't really fit in. Not sure what questions to ask. As soon as we started off, everything just fell into place. And I've got whole loads of questions. However, unfortunately, I've literally run out of time and I'm going to get in trouble. It's up to you if you want to stay and talk to the guys. I'm sure they've got lots of uh, questions for you, but that's up to you and they won't hold it against you if you don't from me before i sign off thank you very much you've been an excellent interviewee talk very well and you clearly know your job really well basically um, which is great to see uh, any closing thoughts before i kick off any closing thoughts from snooki or closing statement or whatever uh no i uh, i enjoyed the interview thanks for the opportunity cap i hope i answered some questions for some people that had them uh if I had to be honest, I wouldn't recommend my career for people <laughs> unless you really, really like nuclear power. It's it's not that much fun a lot of the time. Sometimes it's great, but a lot of times it's just real boring, mm-hmm. strenuous uh, work on the ship. So mm-hmm. there are better there are better jobs. D- definitely look at your options, and like I said, fight for the job you want. More job. Okay, so thank you very much. Much appreciated. And you and everyone else, I'll see you guys later. <laughs>